And welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. 40 to 50% of school-aged children have underlying nasal allergies that interfere with their performance in school. Stuffy nose, drainage, blocked head, clearing of the throat, sneezing fits, itching eyes, blocked ears, headaches, blocked sinuses, a myriad of symptoms simply because of underlying nasal allergies. If we can find out what somebody's allergic to, if we can cut down on those exposures, if we can cut down on the allergy problem, then the student will be able to perform better. That's what we'll be talking about on this show. We'll be talking about how to identify underlying allergic problems in school-aged children and how taking care of that problem can improve their health. My guest is Dr. Karthik Krishnan. He's a board-certified allergist, and he handles these questions every single day. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on The Dr. Bob Show as we're learning how to improve the health of school-aged children. A lot of information for you. Remember, you were once a school-aged child, and you may still have residual allergies that we need to work on. A lot of information for you. We're talking with Dr. Karthik Krishnan, board certified allergist, and we're talking about school aged children and allergy problems causing them not to perform well. Karthik, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you for having me, Dr. Bob. How important is a bad nose or the bad allergic nose? Yeah, so nose allergies can cause a lot of problems in kids. They suffer from runny nose, sneezing, itchy nose, congestion. And this can cause a lot of problems like ear infections, sinus infections, headaches, vision problems. And when you translate this into school function, we know we have good evidence to show that kids who have poor, poorly controlled nose allergies, they don't function as well in school. They don't perform as well due to lack of concentration and focus. And also they miss a lot of days of school due to illnesses and sickness. So it's a big problem, yes. a major problem. If we could correct it, we could make things a lot better for school children. Yes. How do you recognize, where, are there some tips of the trade where the school teacher could identify or where the parent at home could identify? Who's got a bad nose? It's keeping them from um, performing. Yeah, so when they come into the office, we're looking for signs and symptoms. So when I look at a patient, if I see something across their nose called a nasal crease, from them going like this a lot. It's called an allergic salute. Yeah, so, it's, so it pushes a little crease right up there. Yeah. And that you can see that when yep. the patient walks in your office. Yeah, so that's one um, sign that we can see. Another sign we can see sometimes under the eyes, they get these fine little creases. Um, so that sometimes clues me in that they may have allergies. And then when I look in their nose, there's these structures called turbinates. They're little bony structures and they have a mucous membrane over it. A normal one would look nice and pink and moist looking, but an allergic membrane will look kind of swollen and what the fancy medical terms called edematous. And sometimes it might even have like a little bluish tinge to it. So and they're so a tip that there's an underlying allergy that's causing the problem. Correct. Now, if what it, the problem's going inside the nose, so it makes it where they can't breathe out of the nose. Correct. And when, we all know when you can't breathe out of your nose, you don't feel good. That's right. You feel right. hot, you feel warm, it's hard to eat, it's hard to almost do anything. You Correct. can't really concentrate. Correct. So how do you get that person to seek help to where they can get their nose better and how do you get that nose better? Yeah, so a couple of things. So the parents, if they notice that every, my kid's sick a lot, um, their nose is always junky. Um, one of the common things I always hear is, my son's always in the back seat and he's going 
<laughs> making these snorting noises and it's driving everybody crazy. crazy. Um, or they're having trouble sleep, sleeping at night, they're snoring a lot, or they're just not resting comfortably. Um, and then same in the school setting, if the teacher, the kids just seems to sneeze a lot, he's blowing his nose a lot, he just seems real stuffy and congested, and he's not paying attention in class. So those are clues that the kid needs to come in to be seen by an allergist. If they can't breathe through their nose, then they're probably mouth breathing. Yeah, yeah. They're breathing with their, they're sitting there with their mouth open, the lips yeah. get dry, the lips get cracked. It, it must really be at a miserable existence. Mm -hmm. um, just simple little uh, things from the drugstore help? Yeah, there's some simple over-the-counter things that you can start with. You can start with antihistamines, um, something like uh, Claritin, a Zyrtec, or Allegra. You can always start there. How do you know which one to pick? So all of them, all the antihistamines, those types of antihistamines, they all work pretty well. The big problem with the antihistamines is they don't help with congestion. They'll help with the runny nose, the sneezy nose, the itchy nose, but they won't help with the congestion. So what's going to help with the congestion? That's where somebody's yeah. really trying to sniff up their nose because they're trying to establish an air pathway. Correct, correct. What helps with the congestion? Yeah, so the best medicine option for the nose congestion is going to be a nose spray. And there's two options for nose sprays. There's a steroid nose spray like a Flonase, a Nasacort, a Rhinocort or you can use an antihistamine nose spray like an Astapro or a Patinase, or those are a couple so types of So you've really got several options Correct. to treat that patient once you identify them. Is it pretty easy for mama to identify who she needs to take to the doctor or it just seems like everybody, he just gets sick all the time? Yeah, any child that has no symptoms, whether it's runny nose, sneezing, if they're sick a lot, any kind of upper airway problems, we're happy to see them. So let's see what a blocked nose, what other problems does it cause? For instance, the ear. What happens as yep, far yep. as the ear goes in the nose? Yeah, so you can get ear infections. Why? Um, what happens is there's a tube that connects the back of the nose to the middle of the ear. It's called a eustachian tube. So if you have allergies, there's going to be increased mucus production in that eustachian tube, as well as increased inflammation or swelling in that eustachian tube. And so that makes it, sets it up for bacteria to go in there and settle in there and cause an ear infection. And ear infections are pretty incapacitating to they a can. young person. Yes, yes. So the doctor sees the patient, recognizes something's wrong, and eventually knows that it's allergy and they end up in the allergist's office. Can the allergist usually help that problem? Yes, yes. We have plenty of options to help uh, treat their symptoms. How do, you, how do you know if they're allergic? I'm going to ask yeah. you that again later on because I want to get to some other possibilities of what's going on. Yeah. How about if somebody gets sinus headaches? Yeah. Where, yeah. Are si where are the sinuses and how do they cause headaches? Yeah, so we have a couple sinuses. Um, in children, they're not all completely formed, but the sinus cavities, there's, there's two in the cheeks right here and there's some right between the eyeballs, way back in between the eyeballs. And then we have some sinus cavities in the forehead. So, so all of those can block and cause pain. Correct. And that pain, pain is because all because of the allergy blocks the nose, blocks the sinus, that gives the pain, and you gotta fix it. Correct, correct. So you fix it the same way you fixed the, the ear problem, the eustachian tube, with an antihistamine, with a decongestant, with those yeah. sprays? Correct. What if those don't work? So if those don't work, then, the, then we, we always have um, allergy shots. It's called immunotherapy. That's our best long-term option because we can get rid of the allergies or we, we can get very good control of them. So we, what we're trying to do is get rid of the underlying inflammation that's causing all the problems. And once we do that, they get much better symptomatic relief. Do you have a way to know what to put in the shot extract? Is yes. there skin testing and yep. what's it like? Yeah, so um, we can do allergy skin testing. It's real simple and easy. So the things that we can test for are things like tree pollens, grass pollen, weed pollens, cat, dog, dust mite, and mold. And what we do is we take a little plastic toothpick, okay, it's not a needle, um, it's very, uh, it doesn't hurt. And what we do is we gently prick the skin. So we put a drop down 
and we just gently prick the skin. It doesn't draw any blood, it doesn't hurt. We wait 15 minutes and we get the results. So you can tell if somebody is allergic to the things that you suspect or you have a panel that you put and it guides you toward what you should be thinking about. Correct, correct. I think that's what we'll talk about when we come back. The skin testing, we'll see how it's really done and we'll see the information it gives us and how that helps the allergist improve the performance of the child that's in school at whatever level. So it could be at a very beginning of school or it could be more advanced. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about that. We're talking with Dr. Karthik Krishnan, board certified allergist. We've been talking about school age children and how allergies affect their performance how you identify the person. Uh, the person has horizontal creases from doing the allergic salute. They have dark, they have creases, they have allergic shiners. They're sniffing and they're snorting. They're driving the family crazy. And with that, we suspect that person can have underlying allergy. Then we've got to do testing to find out if they are allergic and what they're allergic to. So let's go back to to the testing and how that's done. Yeah, okay, so there's a couple ways to do the testing. So for infants and toddlers, um, they a lot of times they can't sit still for long periods of time, so we wanna <laughs> kinda get the tests on there pretty quickly and um, and make them comfortable. And so one, the device we, I like to use for the little ones is just these plastic prongs. Um, they're, they're not needles, once again, they're, it's very gentle and it's real quick and easy. We just gently press it against the skin and push it down, hold it and pull it back up. And then we wait 15 minutes, um, similarly to what we do when we use this other, which is the, it's called a Greer pick, which is like a plastic toothpick. And we do the same idea we just, where we just gently prick the skin. Um, so both methods are effective and um, we wait 15 minutes and we'll get results. And a positive result will look like a mosquito bite. It'll have a pale puffy center and um, an area that's red around it um, and it'll itch. So that's the allergic reaction that you've pulled out of the skin. So it's Correct. an antigen antibody type thing, medical names, Correct. that will identify what you're allergic to. Yes. So what are you looking for? Yeah, so before we even do the testing, we take a good history. And what we're what trying to- What does that tell you? Yeah, so what we're trying to look in the history is we're trying to identify what their triggers are. So what are certain environments that, where you seem to have more symptoms? So every time Jack is in Ms. Uh, Barton's class, he seems to sneeze a lot. Um, and then when Avery's outside running cross country, she's, her nose is always running and she's sneezing. So we're to get, trying to get the history, look for patterns, look for certain environments of when it's happening. Is there, is it year round? Is it just certain times of the year? Is it just every April? Um, so you've got to they, take a pretty uh, in intensive history to find out if it's outside or inside and what room or what area seems to be. Yeah. Could it be that something at home that you're actually bringing into school and it's yeah. just showing itself from home? Correct, correct, yes. So That's what, certainly a possibility. What do you look for at home? Yeah, so things, indoor allergens that we consider in the home, so we're looking at dust mite, so that's a year-round indoor allergen, anything that's warm and fuzzy, carpeting, upholstered furniture, drapes, beddings, blankets, and then anywhere there's- So that's storage. almost everywhere. Correct. That's and it, in a house. Anywhere you, there's storage items, so cabinets, closets, bookshelves, drawers, anywhere you store items, there could be dust mite. And then pet dander is the other big one, so cat dander, um, and dog dander. Is there a difference between the two from an allergy, allergy standpoint? Yeah, cats tend to be the troublemakers. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the cat dander is really sticky, so it sticks to everything. So if you ever notice cat owners, they kind of, they have the cat hair all that sticks to them. Yeah. Because it has this, it's an electrostatic um, property to it, so it sticks to everything. So cat owners bring their cat dander, so for example, a child will bring the cat dander into school. So even if a child that you're, that you're sitting next to doesn't own a cat, 
they're still going to be ex they can still be exposed to cat dander because it jumps across the aisle in the schoolroom and will cause problems. So Correct. if anybody's got a cat at home, probably anybody in that class could have cat dander yes. exposure. Yes. Exactly. Now, how how can you know if somebody the exposure is causing the symptoms? Yeah, so then we link it back to the skin testing. So uh -huh. if on the skin test they show up to cat and then um, we go and we talk to them and we dig more into the history and say, do you, are there kids in your class that have cats? And if they say, yes, we have a couple kids that have cats, then that, that links it together. And the medical, fancy medical term is it's clinically relevant. So that means that, that the cat dander is likely the trigger for the, the child's symptoms. And that's commonly overlooked, that somebody else is bringing the cat dander into the room, but it's causing child X, the, the problems and the Correct. symptoms. Yeah. What other things are brought in from home to the class that can expose the whole class? Yeah, so um, the, the other things that, um, if they're in the classroom and the windows are open, and it's depending on the time of the year, say it's springtime, April, May, certainly tree pollens can come in, uh, grass pollen can come in, weed pollen can come into the classroom, so that's certainly another possibility. So the, the child doesn't really have a chance uh, if they're in pollen season, they're going to get Correct. exposed to that. Yeah. So and if they've been out during recess or been outside playing, um, or if they have a sport activity after school, they're going to be exposed to those outdoor allergies. Is there any certain time of year that you find will be worse, the spring or the summer or the fall, from a school standpoint, from a student standpoint? Yeah, spring tends to be the tougher time of year, just because that's when the trees are pollinating. And in East Tennessee, we have 200 different species of trees, <laughs> and, and they all pollinate at different times. So it's a long season, and there's constantly trees being pollen, pollinating, and then and then on top of that, the grasses will start pollinating during tree season as well. So you get a double whammy of, of pollen. Uh, that's when you get the little green dust that's yeah. on the car. That's the combination of tree and grass pollen. That's right. And then it all gets mixed in also by what they're bringing home from school. So Correct. Uh, that's why people have lots and lots of problems in school with their allergy symptoms. Yes. Sinus infections. Yeah. Are they enter, do they uh, have a pathway coming from the allergies as to why the child gets more infection? Yeah, so ch children who are prone to getting sinus infections, it's very common to have underlying allergies. And the reason why, going back to what I said previously, allergies cause inflammation. So anytime you have inflammation, the nose and the sinuses don't do their job like they're supposed to, draining and filtering, getting rid of debris, eliminating viruses, eliminating bacteria from the nasal passages and the sinus cavities. And so when the body can't do that, you're gonna be more prone to getting sinus infections. So when you've done skin testing, the skin testing determines that tree pollen and cat, po mm -hmm. and cat dander or mold spores is causing the problems. Uh, then what do you do about it? Yeah, so then we, once we've taken the history and the physical exam, we've got the skin test results, we put everything together and we tailor a plan to specifically for each child to see what would work best for them. Sort of like boutique treatment. Correct, correct. Everything special for that one person. Yeah. Depending on their age, it, the allergy shots are going to be our best option, okay? Typically, we try not our the experts in our field recommend not using shots under the age of four. Now, you can certainly do it in extreme cases, but usually four is about the age that we'll start having a discussion about allergy shots. Um, but allergy shots are our best long-term option because we can get rid of the allergies or get very good control of them. What do the allergy shots do that are so much more effective long-term yeah. than medications? Yeah. And let's talk about that when we come back. We're talking with Dr. Karthik Christian, board certified allergist. We're talking about allergies in school age children and how they cause so many problems with not being able to perform well in school because of simple, not really simple, underlying allergies that are causing problems. We've got 
to skin testing and deciding on allergy shots versus medications. How do you make that decision? Yeah, so if, there's, if they're having a lot of symptoms, and more importantly, if they're having a lot of complications, sinus infections, ear infections, headaches, and we just need a higher level of relief to get things under control, then allergy shots are a great option because we can trick the immune system so we can get rid of the inflammation and the underlying allergies so we get much better control of their symptoms and we can prevent um, a lot of the complications like the ear infections and the sinus infections and we can minimize the reliance on medications. It must be great to be able to trick the immune system as you say. Yes. How, when you say trick it, what do you mean? Yeah, so there's a couple theories. The first, the, there's two phases to it. Early on, what happens is um, what hap the aller when you have an allergen, the, the immune system thinks it's dangerous and it attacks it. So early on with allergy shots, the immune system starts sending out signals to say, don't attack it, it's okay. And then later on in the course of allergy shots, what happens is the immune system pr pr uh, creates these protective antibodies or shields so it'll knock out those other antibodies. Are there any of the allergy shots that seem to be more effective than others for tree pollen? You mentioned grass mm -hmm. pollen, weed pollen, dust, mold, cat dander. Are all of these very effective? Yep, they're effective for all of those allergens. And so how long do you have to take the shots? How often are they? Yeah. Uh, where do you get the shots? Yeah, so a typical course of allergy shots is anywhere from three to five years. And it's initially, there's a build called, it's called a build up phase. You can go in once or twice a week to get your shots. And typically we want you to get your shots at a medical office where there's a skilled nurse that can administer the shot. And we administer the shot on the arm. Um, and it's just a little pinch. It's not, it's not like a COVID shot or a flu shot that can hurt sometimes. <laughs> These are just little pinches. Um, and we do them on the arm. And initially through that buildup phase, you go in once to twice a week until you reach your top dose, which is called a maintenance dose. And then you go on for a week for about eight months. And then we stretch it out to every two weeks, then every three weeks, then once a month. So how effective are the shots? Yeah, shots are very, very effective. Over 80% um, improvement in symptom control. If somebody decides not to take allergy shots mm -hmm. and they just use medicines, yeah. will the allergies eventually just go away? They won't go away, but we can still at least control some of the symptoms. So you can guide with medicine, get some control, but okay. if you really want to get to the heart of the problem, you have to utilize tricking the immune system. I, lo I love that phrase, uh, where the allergy shots will take over. That's How right. frequent are they? So initially they're once or twice a week, and then eventually you'll go out to um, every two weeks, then every three weeks, then once a month. And so once a month is not as bad as twice a week. Correct, correct. Uh, but you've got to pay your dues in order to get rid of the allergy, trick the immune system. Yeah. Does uh, taking allergy shots keep you from getting allergic nose problems to getting allergic lung problems? Will it prevent you from maybe getting asthma? Yes, we can prevent the development of asthma. And I, I think that's that's an, another lecture in itself. Yes, but yes. the fact that the if you start early with the allergy shots, you can prevent other problems Correct. from happening. Correct. Uh, Carthy Christian, you're, you're a great teacher. Thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob Show yeah. and telling us we need to look for allergies that are interfering with the performance of students. And then we have to make sure that they get the proper allergy evaluation with skin testing and deciding on medicines or allergy shots. You'll have to come back and teach us some more again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And remember, in addition to the allergy shots, there are things that you need to do to maintain your health so that the body will be able to handle the improvement that the allergy shots are giving you. So what do we like to do? Well, we like to do four main things in the Dr. Bob Show. Number one, it's regular exercise. When you exercise, you're outside, you'll be exposing yourself to more pollen, but you'll also be creating better activity for muscular growth, for development of your lungs, uh, that will help keep you from hopefully uh, getting asthma. Be sure that you're eating properly. 
When uh, you're thinking about eating, you need to be sure that you're having a nutritious breakfast, fruit and fiber, and that you watch what you're eating. We now know that what we eat has a lot to do with how effective our health is. So be sure that you're exercising, that you're eating properly. Uh, be sure that you're getting seven and a half hours sleep. Sometimes sleep is a real problem. We feel like, oh, I don't need that much sleep. And then you're falling asleep during class and during school and you're not functioning and you're not thinking as well. So be sure that you get at least seven and a half hours sleep. Different age groups and different people will need a little bit different, but be sure you're getting at least seven hours sleep. You do that by simply timing when you go to bed and timing when you have to get up. And when you wake up, you should be having at least seven and a half hours sleep. If you need more than that, simply get more by going to bed early. And most of all, what is it we like in the Dr. Bob show? It's that laughter in your life. It, have a good time with your friends. Enjoy uh, having a good time. Laugh a lot, giggle a lot, share funny stories a lot. And remember, the happier you are and the more you laugh, the more healthy you'll be.